today on the TMZ Podcast. Welcome to the TMZ Podcast. Derek and Eric here. Good morning. Uh, good morning to you. So let's jump right into some good stories because we have a full slate. I want to start with Elon Musk and the Twitter drama. Yeah. So it is ongoing. The trial for this uh, case wh- where you remember Elon agrees to buy Twitter. For $44 to, billion. For 50, yes, exactly. For $44 billion, $54.20 a share. He then tries to back out of the deal. Obviously, the economy is a bit in shambles. The price of Twitter has tanked. And when you agree to buy a company for more than you expected to pay or the deal looks worse in the future, sometimes buyers get cold feet and they try to back out. Well, he backed out of the deal. And Twitter said, no, you don't have a good enough reason. We're going to hold your feet to the fire. We're going to sue you. Drag you to court and ask the court to force you to buy this company, which is an extreme remedy. It doesn't often happen, but you could see it here in in Delaware. Um, Well, as they're gearing up for the trial, you take depositions, you do discovery, you get documents. Elon wanted to depose the CEO of Twitter because a lot of the controversy is about uh, the number of spam bots, we'll call them, that they that they uh, put in their financial filings over the years. For the past five years, they said, we have this number of spam bots. Elon Musk says they have way more. Which means he's getting fewer number of actual people. Real so he's like, oh, yes. now you're not really giving me as much as you said you were. That's right. That's right. He wants to prove that they deliberately misled him. Uh, they've been misleading, I guess, the government as well, misleading their advertisers, because spam bots and the number of them uh, relate to the business, the, the sort of central core of the business. What's which the is number of users you have? If you have a, real find users. a significant number are fake, then it's not worth as much. Now, what's interesting, to take a step back, is part of the reason Elon decided to buy Twitter, because he's a very public a person is he tweeted endlessly about I want to address the spam bot problem. The, Twitter has a problem with a lot of spam bots, and I want to go in, take over the company, and address this problem. So now to use it as an excuse to back out of the deal, a little suspect. Yeah, but, to say I'm going to buy it to fix a thing, and then be like, well, I don't want to buy it because they didn't already fix the thing. Right. <laughs> yeah, he's like, the, oh, the thing is way worse than I expected. Yeah, so I don't, I don't want to clean up this mess. Well, he wants to depose uh, see uh, the tw- the CEO of Twitter, which is Parag Agrawal, um, and you know, you set up these deposition notices, and he says. Parag didn't show up. And this is just drama. Usually these are very hard to get the depositions of CEOs because they're very busy people. They are, you know, not always available. And you usually have to sort of schedule around uh, with their availability. Well, Parag didn't show up. And Elon is saying, I want to go into court and file a motion for contempt. This is sort of gamesmanship. He's it, probably it, not going to do this. Elon, for, for all of his accomplishments and things, is also a master troll. Master troll. And is this a real legal maneuvering, or is this just him trolling again? This is posturing, if you ask me. Because remember, Elon is also going to be deposed. And sometimes in a case, you want to get first crack at someone. So who is? both of them are subject to a deposition. And maybe Parag is saying, well, I want to hear what Elon has to say about why he bought the company before I sort of give my testimony about uh, what I told him. So there's a little bit of brinksmanship. These are very, very high-paid law firms. They're making a lot of drama out of a missed deposition. This is not going to be a big deal for either. Even if he goes in and gets a motion for contempt, it's going to be a slap on the wrist. The trial is going to go forward on October 17th. Elon is doing everything he can to try to basically delay this as much as possible because if he creates more confusion, it helps him. Twitter wants a very clean case. We had a contract. You bought the company. Judge, just make him buy the company. Elon benefits from saying, oh, there's these security issues. There was a new report that uh, a former Twitter employee said, oh, there's a lot of security issues, including spam bots. And he wants to depose that person and just basically throw enough uncertainty into the deal that it scuttles it and he's able to extract either you know, a concession on the deal price or whatever. But yeah. the drama over depositions is is really a sideshow. And and it is. And it, I think part of Elon's thing was, you know, when he announced he was going to buy Twitter, all the all the Elon bros on Twitter were like, yeah, do it, buy it, save it. And now if he's backing out of it, he's got to save face with them. Yes. So he he's really got to be does. like, well, guys, I was, I was going to come fix this for you, but ugh. This is a real test of our legal institutions. I, I've said this with, with, with Trump cases before. That there, there's a sense with Elon Musk, they're very different people, but there's a sense that he believes he is a bit above the law. And I don't want to be sort of too provocative with how I say that, but he thinks he can back out of this deal because he can back out of this deal, and he just will. Now, if a court is going to stand up to Elon, he'll probably appeal it and so forth. This could drag out for years. But it's unclear how you force someone to part with their money uh, yeah. who actually doesn't want well, to. Well, maybe, maybe Twitter grounds. said no take backs. You know? Yeah, <laughs> no take backs. So. <laughs> well, I mean, it, this is an interesting case, uh, and, and we'll continue to follow it because it is really just a clash of egos. I think as a lawyer, I look at this case, it's pretty clear that Twitter has the better of the arguments. Yet I'm not confident that Elon won't be able to find some way to wriggle out of it, and, yeah. and he's, you know, he's he's proven himself before, so uh, I wouldn't count him out yet. Well, something that will be sure to uh, set Twitter aflame mm. 
Who is Khloe Kardashian dating? Unbelievable. The saga <laughs> continues. It does. Uh, she was uh, in Italy yeah. and was photographed with this model, Michelle Moroni, who looks like he was like carved out of stone. Very yes. handsome guy. Uh, and of course, people are now like, they were like kind of intimately hugging each other. And of course, like, oh, this is who she's dating now. Right. It looked more than, uh, more than a friendly hug, but it it also you don't know what the Kardashians, whether you're reviewing reality, reviewing yeah. a plot point, you, yeah. you, know, so, you don't know. Spoiler, they're not dating. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was the first time they had met, <clears throat> and they were asked, you know, to take a photo. And she's just affectionate. It, well, that's, it, they look <laughs> like they're posing in the photo. Like, she's, yeah. they, they're hugged, you know, he's got his arm kind of around her, and she's close to him, but they're both, like, he's looking at her, she's looking at the camera. Yes. Both people benefit from a photo like this. Michelle Moroni is not a big name. He was no. in a show called 365 Days, but yeah. he's not on the tip of uh, your tongue. He's not at the forefront of no. anyone's mind. So when he has an opportunity to align himself or sort of be in close proximity to a mega star like Khloe Kardashian, he's going to ham it up. It makes sense for him to sort of overplay of the hearts. She is dealing with her own fallout from Tristan, so it makes sense for her to sort of put her arm around another handsome man and, just and have get a, a different have another story conversation line. going besides, oh, poor Khloe. Right, exactly. Right now, the only conversation going on is either I have no sympathy for Chloe. She got into this with Tristan or woe is me, Chloe. And she wants a new storyline. So yeah. she, you know, sidles up next to Maroney so, yeah, and this, they this, both get some benefit. The out of photo it. comes out. Everybody's like, oh, they're dating. But clearly, you know, this isn't a real thing because right. one people saw the photo because he posted it. That's right. There's no so way if Chloe Kardashian is dating clear. this actor that most people have not ever heard of this Italian actor. She's not going to let him control the narrative and put the photo out and scoop her basically on it. That's right. It's going to be revealed. You know, there'll be hints, people will start talking, then it'll be announced on their show or something. That's right. It would have been a much more managed, rolled out experience if, if uh, but I imagine he looked at it and said, like, you know, can I post this? And she probably thought to herself for a second, mm, I need another storyline. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but if but, she had done it, it would have been much more controlled for the rollout, for Hulu, for course, creating some sort of dramatic tension. What and Kardashian so is going to start dating somebody and just put a photo out and say, we're dating? It doesn't work like that. Is there uh, fatigue on your part with the Kardashians? Yeah. I am starting to experience it. Now, I, I respect them and their ability to carry the public's interest for more than a decade now. Yeah, right? 15 I, years. 15 years we have been interested in this rather ordinary family. I, I only say ordinary in terms of their you know, identifiable talents. Their talent is reality television and is sort of generating interest on their personal lives for, for whatever well, that it's, is it's also reality. because you know it's like people say they, they've gotten they're tired of hollywood like you know doing remakes and reboots and yeah. sequels well that's what the kardashians are at this point oh tristan cheated on chloe been there done that I, it feels like we're on season 50 we're, we're of general hospital kim like, and ray j again and, and the sex tape and kanye it's like we've it's circled heard all back of this yeah it's circled back so to the origin maybe story. it's a, a lull period until the the kids get a little bit older i think so <laughs> i think so because the they're kids drama. are like you know very sort of charismatic and interesting but they're still too little to carry a show but when they're teenagers i think you will see the next generation and you'll see sort of the kardashians uh of of the current era recede a little bit well kim will become like chris yes chris will and forge a path as the grand momager or whatever wow <laughs> we're gonna see <laughs> it's, a, it's a dynasty the grand dame of the kardashian clan is is, uh. is is going to emerge uh so fascinating but look we're still talking about it. it's the second story after Elon Musk, which is the biggest story in financial news. We're like, yeah. hey, who's Chloe Kardashian side of the no, next? No, who's Chloe so. Kardashian not dating? Not dating. <laughs> the That's story right. is she's not dating the, somebody. <laughs> the news is non-news. That's how big they are. All right, let's move on to uh, bigger and more serious news. So Roger Stone, he is the Richard Nixon acolyte. He was one of the dirty tricksters of the '70s era, with you know associated with Watergate and so forth. He has a large Nixon tattoo on his back. We can't trust anybody that loves N Nixon that much loves him deeply and <laughs> loves him for the all of the wrong reasons i am also a nixon fan but i don't celebrate these elements of nixon's personality he's sort the of paranoia a, and the cheating it's gross it's gross it's a perversion of all of nixon's to to the extent you think he's had had ideals the the better angels of nixon he he sort of yeah. leans into the worst elements of richard nixon and they become this sort of grotesque uh, monstrosity in roger stone and roger stone then becomes embroiled with donald trump yes of because course. it's a lot of the same things he liked about nixon yes a lot of the same things so there's video that is now surfaced um of Roger Stone, the day before the 2020 election, when there was all the controversy and before January 6th, uh, where he is, I think, in a car. You don't see him. Did you watch the video? He's, you hear his voice and he says, you know, fuck the voting. Let's get right to the violence. If you see anyone from Antifa, shoot to kill. Well, fuck the voting. Let's get right get to right the to violence. Let's get right to it. Shoot to kill. See, a, see an Antifa? Shoot to kill. Yeah. 
come. Done with this bullshit. Sort of agitating. Now, Roger Stone always defends himself by saying, yeah, I'm a provocateur. I say a lot of stuff I don't mean. And yeah. that's how he sort of maintains a comfortable remove from whatever vicious things come out of his mouth. He says, look, I, that's that's rhetoric. Rhetoric is and, not And violent. he says this, this is part of a, a documentary that's coming out. And he's like, oh, this has been heavily edited, basically yes. saying fake news. He's basically calling it fake news. Now, what is more telling is this is the more provocative thing he says where he says, let's get to the violence. Everyone is going to seize on that. But there is another part where he's talking to two guys and he's in a sort of calmer moment. And he says, uh, look, the election results, I believe, this is before the election happens in 2020, he says, I believe they'll be up in the air. And he says, to the extent they're up in the air, we should declare victory early, even if it's not true. Now, this is the core of his political philosophy yeah. and where sort of a lot of people believe the Republican Party is. He says, look, possession is nine-tenths of the law, which it's not, but everyone hangs on to that canard. And he says, what, what he means by that is it doesn't matter. The results don't matter uh, as long as we profess that, that we've won, we can call the rest fraud. I really do suspect it would still be up in the air. When that happens, the key thing to do is to claim victory. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. No, we won. F*** you. Sorry, over. We won. Yeah. You're wrong. F*** you. Maybe. This is the dangerous stuff about Roger Stone. I don't think well, the this is what we saw. Is that Remember, dangerous. you know, the election in 2020 took days before Biden was declared the winner because yes. it was so close in so many places. And Trump was already declaring victory. And we, we saw, we know that was the playbook and it played out and then it led to January 6th. Yes. Like, and we're still dealing with it um, two years later. This is the profoundly anti-democratic sort of sentiment that Roger Stone, that we should be worried about with respect to Roger Stone. If he's able to sort of gain uh, sort of power and he has some degree mm -hmm. of power, he's a little bit of a clown in, in all senses, but... You well, know, he was going to be in prison, but... Yeah, then Trump but he still has him. the ear of important people in the Republican Party. And moving in this direction is just dangerous. Like the other stuff seems, you know, ridiculous and politically motivated and awful in its own way. Violence, obviously, I'm not sort of condoning any way, but I don't think anyone takes Roger Stone seriously when he says he's going to shoot Antifa. He, he, he didn't do that and he probably didn't even mean it. He does mean this. I think mm -hmm. he does mean, like, we can grab power if we just say we won regardless yeah. of we'll, the outcome. we'll win by votes, and if we don't, then we'll just say we won anyway. And then we'll <sighs> set up the system so that that can happen. Yeah, so the clip is going to be part of sort of the House Select Committee, which is investigating the January 6th uh, hearing, you know, the January 6th insurrection. <laughs> I don't know. I want to I tread carefully here. My worry is that when the House looks at Roger Stone, he's such a slippery figure that he is able to twist things into his benefit for his constituency. When they look at this, he's going to look over his shoulder, essentially metaphorically, and say, like, they're so ridiculous. They see this as all serious, and, and I'm not a serious guy. I'm just yeah. sort of a provocateur. And it makes the Democrats look like hand-wringing, pearl-clutching party. Yeah. And that's what I worry about. This is actually serious, but they're and, going and to frame the, it as, you guys are you guys are reading too much into it. You and, take Trump and, too and, seriously. And that's the thing. And to say, you know, that, okay, well, Roger Stone's Roger Stone. He is yeah. who he is and always has been. But nobody in the Republican Party will denounce this. Nobody will. That's right. Because, and that's telling. And that's that's bad. That, that sentiment especially. I don't, I don't want to see, this is, again, not a partisan thing. No party should say, well, we just win whether we do or not. Right. That's how you fall into... A dictatorship and democracy dies, and that's not good for anybody. Right? I don't know why. So how do people you are deal not with someone who says like, ah, this. "Don't take me that seriously when I say ridiculous things"? I'm you just, take him seriously. I'm just, I'm just blowing. You don't let him. You don't let air. him dismiss. When you, when someone has, you know, it's not just like a one-off comment, right? Here or there. Like you said, this is this guy's entire political philosophy. It's his whole career for decades. Yeah, and we see people with power siding with him. Yes. You have, you have to denounce it. You have to take it seriously. I think you're right. I mean, as much as the blowback will be like, look at how ridiculous the Democrats are. They're hypocrites. They do the same thing on their side. That, that is going to be sort of the defense mechanism that you see rolled out by Roger Stone because he's done it countless times. He, I mean, he's, this is not the first time he's been attacked for the things he said or the things he professes to believe on, on talk shows and whatnot. Um, but I think this could be a little bit stickier because it seems like a more private moment. It is awful on its face to sort of say, like, it doesn't matter what the results of a Democratic election yeah. are. He's not even saying that there is fraud. He's saying it doesn't matter because I will say there's fraud. That's what's problematic And then even if the other line is jokey, then to say, well, we can back that up with violence. You know, we're seeing all the things going on in Iran right now, and and I've seen trending pictures of what it was like in the 70s. Yeah. And because pe people think, well, that could never happen here. It we're, could. Yeah. <laughs> we really you don't like... want to be too alarmist, but also history shows how these things happen. I agree. When you have some historical perspective, uh, us being sort of the greatest superpower is a, a precarious balance of a lot of things going on. And we could be losing our grip on that. Believing too strongly anything like, well, that couldn't happen here. Yeah. 
And then it does. It happens in a lot of places. And then it's just, never thought it could happen. And then it's a note in a history book, and you move on. So, uh, yeah. So I'm, this is sort of a dour appraisal of, of yeah. our current state of affairs. But it, but it is something we. It, it's an uncomfortable conversation to have, but we need to. That's the problem. You can't. Yeah. You can't ignore, ignore it or this. dismiss it. Yes. yes. He wants you to sort of. He wants his people to sort of uh, internalize his views and have everyone else ignore them as 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 nonsense. But it's a joke. Really until do it's need not. to take it quite seriously. Um, let's move on to something more hopeful. Yeah. Uh, so well. Hopeful for everybody but Ben Affleck. He's yes. out of a job. It's, because it's NASA does not need people to fly to asteroids and blow them up anymore. This is Armageddon. It this really is Armageddon Except without we didn't Bruce land Willis and drill into Ben Affleck. It. Yeah. Yes. So NASA has a, a, a spacecraft that it's flown into an asteroid. They did this deliberately, crashed it into it yes. to see if they could knock it off course. Yes. This is a, an existential threat to humanity, to, yeah. to life on Earth. If an asteroid of a large enough size impacts the Earth at the, you know, sort of speed that asteroids move, it could be calamitous. I mean, this is what it the could, movie's could, Deep Impact could wipe out humanity, about. yeah. Yes, and we've thought about this since the late 90s, and we and watched this movies is about the it. Kind of, you know, this sounds kind of ridiculous. We paid lots and lots of money to, what, $325 million? $325 million to, to, to ram a rocket, yes. <laughs> yeah, to crash a rocket. <laughs> People but, look at those numbers and must be like, good Lord, what are we doing? But it's to save humanity. I mean, but it is. is it's, it's, it's that sort of, oh, you know, the ounce of prevention kind of thing. That's right. So they, they took a, an asteroid. it seems like a bargain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so they had this asteroid that was not a threat to the Earth. Yes. But they, it was like, okay, this size could be pretty horrible if something like this hit us. Yes. Let's see if we can do this. And they had a camera on the front of the, the, the rocket, and they flew it right into the asteroid. You can see it getting closer and closer. It's sort and of then static the, yeah. images of how close it as it And as then it the signal cuts out. It's unreal. Which is where NASA messed up, because they really should have sent a drone to get the shot of it hitting the I asteroid. agree with the production! <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I was like, oh, so the, the impact is camera explodes. You don't see it. You need the drone circula circulating. Yeah. What's another $100 million for a drone to... At, at that point, send the drone out. Yeah. Because you want to see <laughs> In it. In the vacuum of space, we'll figure out how to fly the drone. Because it would seem way cooler if you could see... Uh, but it is the, the elation uh, of the people in the room. I mean... Th this is this is very difficult to do. I think we watched this, and it seems like a fait accompli because there's a lot of numbers that have been crunched. There wasn't much doubt that they were going to be able to hit the asteroid. But remember, this is a huge accomplishment. That asteroid is traveling at, I think, tens of thousands of miles it's an hour. It's going very it's fast. Going very, the rocket's static. going very fast. So you have these, you know, to, we, we think of an asteroid or a rocket as a huge thing. But yes. in space, they're little tiny specks. That's right. And to get one to hit the other in, in space, in a, in, a, in a spot to redirect its course, and it hit it. It hit it. I think I, that's I looked, much more math and science than I can understand. But it said fortunately, it hit there are people who can within 17 meters of the center of the asteroid. Do you know how small 17 meters is in the vastness of space to hit with that kind of accuracy? Well, no, use feet because this is America. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> don't hit me with meters. I'm not trying to do metric now. So, so what? 50, 50 feet? Yeah, it's it, remarkable. It and, is remarkable that they were able to have that kind of accuracy with that kind of impact. I mean, we do SAT problems. A train is leaving from one station. Uh, you're losing you're, me. You're, you're losing already me. lost, you know? But this is a uh, <laughs> That's a why they were so happy triumph. because, one, the, the math checked out. Yes. And also, they theoretically just saved humanity. That's right. So this this asteroid apparently was going to make, in, in October, was going to make a near miss of Earth. So there weren't high stakes if they missed it because it was going to miss Earth anyway. But they can measure the... Uh, well, you don't want to wait until it is high stakes to test it. That's right. <laughs> we want then, to know that we can hit oops. a moving asteroid yeah. when we see one coming. And now, like, uh, I don't worry about this. I sleep well at night that yeah. we're not going to be impacted by a gigantic and asteroid. And they, they were excited about it. Also because Bill Nye, the science guy, was in the control room, <laughs> <I know>. took <laughs> a selfie. <laughs> Taking selfies in the control room. Perfect. Yeah, you're like, yay, we saved the Earth. And that's Bill Nye. I'm telling you. I mean, we'll have to see how much they sort of altered the trajectory, but the idea is to obviously make it miss, miss impact rather than uh, hit Earth. Because imagine, you know, asteroids are small, but they're bigger than rockets. So it didn't really... It probably didn't change its trajectory all that much, but all you have to do is a fraction Just because enough then to, the distance to not slam is so into far the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic or whatever. Um, I love this kind of stuff, and it was it's so good to see the triumph of nerds in a, in a place because there <laughs> it felt like yeah. a, the end of a trivia tournament for me where they're all like huzzah! Excelsior! Except, except you get like free pretzels, and they might have saved the Earth. So <laughs> this is true. Same, I, same. I get a round of shots, uh, but you don't even drink. That's right. That's right. All right, I want to do one more story. We have a little bit of time, so yeah. I'm going to jump into this because it was interesting to me. Um, the concussion doctor who is, um, what's his name? Bennett Omalu. Uh, we talked to him. Some of our sports guys did an interview with him because over the weekend... Two oh, we should say quickly, his qualifications. One, the Will Smith movie Concussions based right. on him because he's the one who basically discovered CTE. Yes. He studied the uh, anatomy of the brain and saw that all these plaques were developing. And he says, holy cow, football's a really dangerous game. And his, his whole mission has been to sort of profess how dangerous it is. Yeah. And, so he knows what he's talking about. He knows a lot what he's talking about. He is an expert in this field. Um, Tua 
Tua Tagovailoa, uh, the Dolphins' star quarterback, uh, was you know pummeled during a game. He, he hit his he head, slammed his it. head on the turf. The Dolphins subsequently said, "Ah, oh, this was a back injury." But to the naked eye of it Ben and Amalo, he well, said, "Look, you, you his can head see at the turf. you watch when he gets back up and is walking off the field. He he's dazed. He almost collapses. Yes, and and to watch this and see the player sort of taken off the field for a few plays and then come back in to play football." Uh, is horrifying to Ben and Amalu. Yeah. I mean, he's he's not he's a very passionate speaker. He's not sort of overwrought with like tears or anything, but he's very matter of fact. And what he says is, "Look, uh, this guy suffered permanent brain damage. I I, I don't want to sort of sugarcoat this." He says, "When your brain hits against your skull, uh, it is damaged by that in a permanent sense." And he says, "I thought what was interesting here is he says, look, if Tua uh, if Tua broke his leg on the field, he'd obviously be carted off the field. He'd have a broken femur or whatever leg bone, and he'd have to be out of the game for three months." He said, "The same should happen with his brain. How on earth can we pull him out of his game?" Give him some smelling salts and say this guy's ready to go because back because they can still play with a brain injury. They can't play with a broken leg. And and now the, the Dolphins say like they didn't ask him to go back out. He wanted to do it. Yes, but also he if he's concussed, he's not even really a, capable of making straight. that decision. Uh, the thing I, th- I thought that uh, Dr. Malu said was so interesting. He goes, uh, he says your life should be worth more to you than any amount of money. Your life is worth more than ten billion dollars because you can't replace your life. You have on- you only have one life. I thought it was so powerful. I really do. And this is, he also sort of uh, expressed sentiments that make it clear that he'll never be an NFL doctor because yeah. if he sees concussions, he says, I want to keep them out for three months. I mean, that's that's what would is necessary for the inflammation to subside. The season would be very short. It'd be a very short <laughs> season. He would never get a job in that way. And that, that to me is really sad. And he says, he puts a little bit of the blame on, on Tua where he says, look, uh, yes, the doctors cleared him, but no one put a gun to his head that he said he had to run out there. I, I, I think it's a little uncharitable because when you, when you have a coach or a doctor saying, hey, you're fine, you're cleared to play, there's a, there's a sort of culture of machismo to be like, well, then I'm going to yeah, go out there I, and play. I mean, play. look at how much just people with, with like Simone Biles when she said she you know, didn't want to be part of the team yes. for her own health. Look how she was savaged. Yeah, because, yes. it, because people weren't just, oh, well, look how you're letting your team down. Yes. If you're a football player and you, and you think I'm capable of going back and doing this and nobody's telling me I can't, which is why it's incumbent on the doctors, the adults in the room. Remember, Tua and the athletes, they have one mission, their tunnel vision. They, they want to perform on the field, and they want to execute and, and, and win. But, and even for the doctor's so the point doctors of view, this is, this is sad, but if you're the doctor and you think, oh, this team's pr- going to lose this game if I hold this player back. Yes. Do you want to deal with the fans and the organizations? And you'll be fired, probably. You have to have someone with a tremendous backbone, like a Bennett Amalu, who takes their job very seriously and their oath as a doctor to do no harm very seriously. The problem is, guys like that never get the job. You know, you're, you're, you're in a system where... You can find a doctor who will be like, he's fine. Yeah, you're sort of interviewed by your ability to get players back on the field, not your ability to hold them off the yeah. field and be as cautious and concerned as possible. So I find this endemic to the sport. It's a real big problem. You know, I have kids. I I would never let. My, I never played football uh, because I always knew it was damaging to my brain, and my brain yeah, that's was an the important reason. thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's what held you back. I mean, I had that such big raw brain just held you back. I know, but I wouldn't let Carter play. I, I think it's I think it's a sport that will over time be looked at as very very savage, almost in the realm of cockfighting and things like that. That we look at as savage sports. No, nah, but there's a lot of money that. behind it, too. There's so much money behind it. And people love it. It's, you know, the people like, like, I love this team because my dad loved this team because his dad loved this team. There's yeah. like generational things. People we are going to let, let go. Of that. No. Listen, I, I we got know. long traditions that we let go. There's a lot of problematic no, things we've done as a civilization you know, like, that we let go. Early football, remember they had like the leather helmets. Yes. And then they're like, well, that's not good enough. So do we hit a point where the teams come out and they're all just like in bubbles? Like, <laughs> I guess so. We've made it almost so safe that they're using their heads like missiles. I mean, the, the sport is in a really problematic, uh, precarious position now. Uh, you think it'll last because it's a very proud tradition. I think it will, too. I think it, we won't see in our lifetime football go the way of cockfighting and, or but, anything but like but that. Also, but the difference it, is you have to, like, what, what they were pointing out with this case is that Tua wanted to go back. Yes. If, if the players are like, I want to do this, regardless of the risk, and they want to do it, how do you stop them? Yeah, you have to have someone say, no, I'm not letting you go back in the game because if Tua wanted to limp out in the field with a broken leg, we wouldn't let him. And I think we have to start viewing brain trauma in the same way as we view broken bones. But we'll see. We'll see. That'll do it for us. Uh, Go ahead and download the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.